Hello everyone, welcome to Adventures in Careerland. Hello everyone, it's Adriano Magnifico here. I'm the uh, career and entrepreneurship consultant for Louis Real School Division. And this is our 11th episode our holiday edition of Adventures in Careerland. And this is a momentous occasion because we've got some special, a special guest, but we also have our regular duo of producers. And of course, I'm talking about Lily Chen. Hello. Podcast Media Program. Lily, how are you? I'm good. Perfect. You're perfect all the time, right? Yeah. Okay. She just told me, I need sleep. I've got to have sleep. <laughs> That's what she just told me. So she's not quite as perfect. That's her Hollywood persona. Oh. That's what she talks about. And of course, you have Isabella Suarez. How are you doing, Isabella? I'm doing well. Hello, everyone. Oh, it's so nice to see you. And of course, these two able, smart, intelligent people are producing this podcast. They've been doing it since episode one. And they're part of the broadcast media program at the Lou Riel Arts and Tech Center at the ATC as we know it. There are 13 programs and the uh, broadcast media program is one of those gems where students learn like in all the programs, but in this program, I feel it hands on because I'm right immersed in their culture. They learn the work skills and the environments and the professional attitudes that you need to have to work in this environment. So it's my great privilege to have them on the team I'm feeling slightly sad because they're going to leave at some point once the semester ends. Mm, and yeah. we'll mm. have to train a new gr group of people that I fear will never be as good as you two. Oh, oh. thank you. I know, I know. That's really it's, nice. It's, <laughs> it is. It is. You know, it's, I mean, it's just, it's just the way I feel and that's the way it goes. Today, we've got in episode 11, a special guest. And her name is Cosette Baudin. Cosette is a former student at Collège Jeune Sauvé. So she is a, a, a product of the, the French Immersion Program in, our, in the Lurie School Division. But she also did something very interesting. She chose to participate in one of those 13 programs at the Arts and Tech Center. And it was called the Applied Business Management Program. So Cosette, welcome to this program. This is your chance to say hello, and she's in her she's in her room. She got a crazy curtain with her. That's just insane. She's got a map of the world, and this is who <laughs> she is. She is a worldly person. Tell us, Cassette, how you feeling? How's the Christmas season going? In fact, I'll throw this open to everyone. What is everybody having for Christmas dinner? Cassette, what are you having for Christmas dinner? Because you have a particular you're a mate you have Métis background, don't you? That's so funny that you mentioned that because we're actually having elk uh, this season. My dad got his first elk and that's what's on the table for the next couple months. The next couple of months. So this is not a Christmas dinner. This is the, uh, the, the long-term dinner. <laughs> the elk. So yes. now, now is Christmas a real traditional uh, food that you guys eat that's part of your tradition? Um, not particularly. Uh, Christmas for me actually feels a lot more like my mother's side. Uh, and she's Danish. She speaks Danish. Um, and we celebrate lots of Nordic traditions. So what would be a Nordic food you eat? This is amazing. I've never heard of this before. <laughs> uh, so we have lots of goulash, but it really comes in when it's uh, the desserts. Uh, so we have honey cooking and we have, um, different spice cookies and so on. Well, that sounds great. Isabella, what do you guys, uh, Isabella's from Brazil and she's an international student here what, and she wants to take root in Winnipeg. Lily's from China, who's mm -hmm. taken root in Winnipeg <laughs> as well. So Isabella, what do you guys, what kind of food do you eat at Christmas time or the holiday season? And I say the holiday season, happy Hanukkah to everybody. We're in the midst of that. And to whatever celebration this looks like for you, I hope it's a great celebration. What do you do in Brazil for food? Um, usually we gather like the whole family to eat barbecue. 
so that's our main dish um and like each person brings something so if like for example my aunts are bringing dessert um like some cake or something um like my mother can do rice my grandma can bring like some type of uh like how they say it? So, something to go along with the barbecue but usually side we dish, do barbecue like side yeah dish. like a side dish yeah okay. <laughs> so lily in china Huh. What do you guys eat? Can you guess? I think every foreigner. I, I'm going to say something that will sound stereotypical and stupid. So tell me what you actually. <laughs> <do. Okay. laughs> I think everybody know dumpling, oh. right? Yeah. yeah. For Chinese people, dumpling is a kind of, uh, I mean, everywhere. It's the holiday treat. Mm -hmm. Yes, and no matter what kind of holiday, the main core is the dumpling but oh, wow. vanilla is like you have everything but f finally instead of your desert mm -hmm. desserts yes it's dumpling oh <laughs> nice so are you making dumplings this year with your family in winnipeg oh yeah sure okay excellent <laughs> so we're expecting a few dumplings to come in here oh, oh yeah because we have to try the dumplings <laughs> Cos Cosette, you're welcome to slip in here and have some of the dumplings. <laughs> That'll be awesome. So, Cassette. Will do. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about some of your background as a kid. What kind of things did you like to do? Because this is a podcast where we like to go back in time and think about all of who you were, what you valued, what was fun to you. As a little kid, what kind of activities did you like to do that connected to you, that just flowed with you and just the time just flew when you were doing them? Uh, my entire life, I actually wanted to be an entomologist, uh, and that's someone who studies bugs. Bugs? Okay, so what did you do as a kid? Were you just... Yeah, I, you just uh, turning over forest? rocks. Turning over rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's a metaphor for you. As I've gotten to know you, that's a metaphor for you because you are a, per, a perpetual rock turner over. I love that metaphor because you often step off the beaten path when you were looking for those rocks why were you turning them over as a little kid what was so fascinating to you about all that that there was something alive everywhere oh that's pretty cool that's pretty cool so now when you come into <laughs> you're a french immersion kid you've gone through french immersion so you're you're belaying right mm -hmm. okay so you can work in both environments you feel comfortable working in french and english environments no problem uh, parfois c'est un peu difficile de parler en français. Um, it's only really difficult to work in French when it's um, mostly focusing on writing, but almost always it only takes me a couple, a couple minutes to fully function in French. Yes, yes. So I'm a little conversation in Italian, I get that too. I panic when someone talk, approaches me in Italian and then three minutes later I'm having a conversation with them, which is great. So tell me now, you're at College Jean Sauvé, what kinds of activities were you choosing? What kinds of things were you getting involved in? What was your high school experience like? So my high school experience um, mostly revolved or evolved around um, social justice. That was my real motivator when I was younger. Um, and it translated into when I was in high school. What kind of things did you do in high school that promoted that social justice motif? Um, I almost was obsessed with finding op opportunities about um, community. Uh, so growing up, I, like I mentioned in an earlier conversation, have a, over 100 cousins. Um, and growing up, it became <laughs> obvious to me that so much of um, so many of my friends didn't have that many cousins um, so they didn't and it went further than that some people I knew didn't even have those support systems uh, not that every single one of my cousins support me but uh, that's the general idea so I think social justice uh, went into building community for everyone because I thought that um, so much of who I am comes from that support and everybody deserves to find themselves in that way. 
Yeah, that's an awesome answer. You know what? That speaks to family, right? And you, how important is your family to you? The most important thing. So what kinds of, when you celebrate together, how big are these celebrations? It's going to be hard for you at Christmas. <laughs> uh, well, we actually rent a hall. <laughs> <laughs> You actually so, rent the hall for some of these activities? Yes. Uh, skating rink included. <laughs> so oh we God. play hockey games and yeah, it's genuinely like this is all the tables and chairs are set up. There is over a hundred people in the hall and it's a community hall in St. Estache. It's a mm -hmm. family? Events? Yes, and we're all related. <laughs> oh my god. I can't imagine that a family <laughs> involving over a hundred people. Oh my god. So how often do you do that? How often do you get together and do that? Uh, annually. So there's an annual oh. get-together for your whole family. So what's Christmas dinner like? Is that just a smaller group or your holiday dinner? Or whatever? Yeah, that's about 30 of us. Okay, well that's... That's kind of what we had when I was Italian. We would get together, there'd be, there'd be 30 of us. How big are your celebrations, Lily, when you get oh. together for a holiday celebration? The problem is the recent years in China, like we don't have so many big families as Euro. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, I remember around 10 years ago, I have uh, a big party of my family, means my part and my husband part. So all the relatives that we gather together is 22 people. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Is that part of that one child family thing that went on for a long time? Uh, I think so. Okay, mm -hmm. so that just made everybody... Yeah. Uh, families a little smaller. Yeah, just for example, like in my mom's generation, in her home is uh, three child, and that's very minimized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in other families, they will have maybe four, six or more ch yes. ch children. Mm -hmm. But to my generation, it's like only one. one. Mm -hmm. So you get less and less. Did and anyone ever sneak in a second one there or something or try to? Yeah, they try. But uh, I think up to 2018, the government to give to the regulation to say that you can have... Uh, second one but there is some regulations there to limit mm -hmm. but b before that it's like from 1978 to 2018 I, I think i'm right for the timing it's like you should have only one but there's some people they try to you know snake yeah 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 so, isabel that's a little different for a latin language right yeah, and like these families are huge. Our families are huge. Yeah, we. Uh, I have like a very huge family. Well, not as big as <laughs> Jose. I, I'm like astonished. A hundred people. That's so crazy. It's like an army. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like for for our family was like fifty people, which I think it's a big number still. But um, it's always great, and we don't necessarily um, hang out all the time either, just annually. So, um, but it's always really a great time. Well, we were talking, uh, back when I was a kid, Chrisette and I talked, I talked at one point to her that she, she might or may or may not be related to the old Normie Baudin mm -hmm. of the old Winnipeg Jets in that first year. Bobby Hall, Chris Bordalo, and Norm Baudin created the first famous hockey line in the history of Winnipeg called the Luxury Line. Mm -hmm. And Norm Baudin got a hundred and in three points in that line. And so I've tasked her with finding out if Norm Bowden is one of your relatives. And she kind of said, ah, it probably is. So <laughs> that, we'll find out. You could be related to one of the great Winnipeg Jets, one of the original Winnipeg Jets from 1972. And I just dated myself. That's a shame. Anyway, so tell us more. I, like, when you talk about social justice um, and you talk about possibilities for yourself, my impression of you is always that when you joined the ABM program, you were looking for something different. Is that fair to say? Than just the yes, definitely. Program. So why would you make that call? Because remember, uh, the Applied Business Management program 
is one of the 13 here. Someone come and does a presentation at your school about the Arts and Tech Center. And there are 13 programs you can choose from, but you chose to say, I want to leave my friends for that semester, and I want to go off and immerse myself in a business, applied business management program. Why would you do that? And what, what attracted you to that? So really, it was uh, the school that attracted me originally. I knew I wanted to do one program, and the applied business management seemed most versatile uh, for the future I was planning for myself. It felt um, almost wasteful to uh, not take that opportunity in front of me to uh, get a second uh, diploma um, for free. <laughs> oh. See, that's, that's a great point because people who join this program, there are post-secondary students who join the ATC cadre programs who have to pay a reasonable amount to join these. When you're in the mm -hmm. school division, it's free to you. I love what you said, it's wasteful. I've never even heard it that way. Because <laughs> it, it almost sounds like, hey, I better take this because it's sitting there. But what attracted to you, aside from that, what attracted you about the content of the program and what you thought it could do for you? Because you're also gonna lose some of your French because it's all in English, right? Mm -hmm. So you're making a real sacrifice to come here. Is that fair to say? Um, yes, but it's also about weighing um, the cost and the benefit. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the benefit of uh, improving my interpersonal skills and my uh, professional abilities um, was worth more than um, prolonging the practice of my language, which um, would be hard to forget. And yes. the opportunities are a little more common That's to improve awesome. my language. Now, talk about some of those, like you mentioned them, those skills that you thought you were developing. You, saw, you talked some of the kind of the presentation skills and some of the professional abilities. What kinds of activities did you do in ATC that you, you think give you an extra leg up on other kids who are just taking regular high school program? Confidence is definitely the biggest one. Um, I, and it seems that like since that comes from inside, you could find it anywhere, but that just wasn't the case for me. Um, That's a great I thing, have Lisa, the confidence. If I interrupt, tell me yeah. what did they do to help build your confidence? What is conf you said it comes from inside, but I love what you said. It kind of sits dormant in every student, right? What did the ABM do to stimulate confidence in you? They pushed me. Um, Mr. Kuipers was really great at just giving us a project and saying, the rest is up to you guys. Um, and you're being marked whether you uh, try your hardest or whether you don't. Uh, so it's up to you to try your hardest. And whether it's your mission to grow out of trying your hardest or not, um, you well grow. Uh, I agree with you. When you're thrown into frying pans and you have to survive and the heat gets turned up on that frying pan, that's my bad metaphor, uh, things happen to you. What is, like, do you have a great example of something like, I recall you working on uh, uh, an open air, you were doing a market. Remember that, uh, that artisan market? Talk about that market and the things that you had to do that most high school students don't do and that you learned from it. All, like all the mistakes, it was so messy doing that thing. Do you recall? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, talk about it. So I, I was um, partnered with my friend Kyle and we were in charge of uh, acquiring vendors. Um, and so we had a whole gym to fill up with uh, people who were going to be selling things and it was up to us to contact every single one and confirm and get deposits. Um, so whether we got them was up to us, but if not, it was our empty gym to look at. So how did the whole event go? What, 
what problems did you have first? Like what, like what were some issues? I remember popping in there. I won't say what I noticed, but I, I went in there a few times. What were the biggest issues you had? Breaking out of what I noticed, the normal high school mode into the person in charge of the entire event. What has to happen? What's happening inside of you? Um, I think that it came down to cooperation with all of each other. It's a relatively small class. And I think that as the day got closer, um, we really forced ourselves to cooperate and understand that we all needed to lean on each other in order to achieve um, the end goal. So how did the whole thing Challenges go? we... F oh, it went fantastic. Totally. I, I was stunned because I popped in. I bought a lot of things. <laughs> I, because I saw you guys in action. I thought, oh, this looks like a typical high school class that's been given an assignment. And this is going to be a disaster. But it never turned out that way. Why do you think? Uh, I think it's because it was at the end of our program. Like, if we had that same project at the beginning of our year, it definitely would have been as bad as you assume. <laughs> but because of all the skills we have, to, we had developed over the year, I think that we trusted each other a lot more, which in turn um, brought out the best in all of us. I like that because trust is so important, right? And. I, I, I'm wondering about what skills, when you left that program, what skills did you take out of that program moving forward now into your University One program? I think uh, something that was really important was writing professionally. Mm -hmm. um, not just my vocabulary, but also uh, being having the confidence to send an email without having someone read over it um and me being able to be that person yeah send an emails to people that... who just aren't your buddies yeah people who are... that's another thing realizing that everyone is a person that like no company made itself that's awesome mm -hmm. well what does that matter absolutely it matters because it makes everything less intimidating um going out into business you think wow you know like Google is this great entity that's just so beyond anything I could be, but it's actually just a lot of hardworking people. Um, and people are a lot easier to uh, talk to than legends. <laughs> yeah, that's a great line. So when you're thinking about that experience and the skills you're acquiring and moving forward, are there some spaces now in that that you're trying to fill right now in terms of I, now I want to get good at this now I want to get good at this what are you trying to fill up there a little bit right now or are you still in that generic mode waiting just trying to fill up with whatever happens kind of and moving along uh no I definitely have more specific goals what I'm going for right now is work experience um, so actually this passing summer, I didn't get the job, but I fully applied for a managing position, which never in my wildest dreams would I have had the confidence to do at 17 years old, uh, if I had not taken the program. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, and that's what I'm looking for in the future. I'm looking for, uh, a real adult job, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you don't want to flip burgers anymore? I don't get it, because that, that, that's, that's beautiful stuff. Can I ask you a question, Cosette? Because uh, when Mr. Maxifigo asked you why you choose the Applied Business Management program, and you said it's because you have some future plan. So what is your future plan by then? And uh, did you change your plan up to now? Um, it's ever changing. <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> I'm at a. I want to say I'm at a point right now, but mm -hmm. um, I think I'm just gonna say I'm on a continuous road. Um, <laughs> that, uh, and when I look down that road, it um, 
I can tell it's a gravel road and mm-hmm. the gravel road doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. So I think when I say I'm planning for my future, mm-hmm. I think I want to make myself um, as uh, armored as possible. That way mm-hmm. I can kind of go off-roading. Yep. Wherever the road takes me, I just want to be prepared. Oh, yeah, that's good. So what is the uh, original plan? I mean, by then you choose the ABM program. Uh, the original plan was to um, was to find opportunities through the program. The original plan was to make a plan through the program. <laughs> <laughs> but why this program attracting you more than other ones? Uh, because it was a lot more in line with what I uh, could see myself doing. Mm-hmm. Um, because the field of business is so versatile, you can mm-hmm. legitimately do anything because mm-hmm. every entity in the world has a business aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, I just felt like I could fully commit to it knowing mm-hmm. that I was only fully committing to making myself better for every opportunity mm-hmm. to come my way. Mm-hmm. That's good. And right now you're in the middle of your first year? Am I right? Yes. Okay, so um, f- from transitioning uh, from like high school to university, from this program even, to first year of university, what has been the most challenging thing for you, especially during like COVID? It's such a different environment, um, especially because here at ATC, we can see that it's very like hands-on work. Um, how was it for you transitioning from hands-on work to uh, going back and studying um, and writing papers, all that? Uh, I think that I was always wanting more, which is why my extracurriculars right now are so important to me. Mm -hmm. Um, School, like I'm in, I'm a full-time student, uh, but the the lack of projects uh, wouldn't have been enough for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. which is uh, why I'm actually in youth parliament. Uh, I hold a couple positions um, and that's really what's uh, been my community and what's kept me going. Well, that's pretty cool. You're taking youth parliament. So what is your role in there? Are you a minister? Yes. Okay, what are you a minister of? And did you choose that or did they assign it to you? They assigned it to me. Uh, I minister for communications. Um, I'm also uh, the equity officer for this upcoming session, uh, which is a new role uh, that I've never been a part of and an experience I'm looking really looking forward to. That's so amazing. I mean, throughout this whole year, you that, like you said, there's a lack of projects. And for you to be investing in extracurricular activities, sometimes I feel um, will build you way more than actually doing like a school project because you're getting this experience. And like you said, you're trying now a new position. So what are your hopes for this one? Um, I'm really hoping to gain some more problem solving skills. So the uh, uh, equity officer's position is um, kind of like uh, HR (laughs) for a session. Yes. Um, And I'm doing it with a partner, David Ringham. and I don't know what else to expect. Uh, So I'm really looking forward to it. Well, this comes back to- Minister of Communications has, yes, absolutely. This comes back to you turning over these rocks as a kid, where I'm not not quite sure what's underneath there, but something's gonna be moving, and I think it's gonna be interesting. And maybe I'll put a little mustard on and try them on toast, I'm kidding. Yeah, I but I'm really appreciate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm really like what uh, Cosette said about uh, like you know she's a kind of a kid turn on the rocks, right? Yes. But in fact, in our life, every time you try a new things, it's a kind of turning a rock, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, and then you will find some surprise under the rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you always find things under the rock. I remember being a little kid. I don't know about you guys, but (laughs) boys were different. They were little kids. 
if at the end of the day I didn't come back with a pocket full of bottle caps, wrappers, string, junk I found, it just wasn't a good day. <laughs> it's just an awesome way to look at the world, right? The things you find on the street or under rocks are great <laughs> metaphors for you uncovering those great potentials in you and the great skill sets that you may want to go after, right? Sometimes you uncover a rock. Ever uncover a rock? We'll use your lovely metaphor. You ever uncover a rock and you open it and went, ay, 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 I better throw that rock down fast. <laughs> you ever run into some of those in your, in your university one coursework and stuff? You've gravitated to some other stuff. You've gone, hey, I better get this course over with as quick as I can. Anything like that? Um, actually, not this year course-wise. Um, course-wise, I took lots of intro classes and... I think the only thing that was scary about the rocks I turned over um, without was how uh, big and heavy they were and how little was underneath. Um, oh, jeez. That's a great metaphor. that makes sense. It makes great sense. <laughs> what, what it, now, what are you saying? What does that mean? I love it. It means that um, it was, though the classes are just so profoundly interesting, if I didn't have this profound interest, it would be very very difficult to follow mm -hmm. uh it feels like i'm pushing myself to uh maintain uh an engaged mindset um okay what's the course that's doing that uh, give me one of your yeah. courses that you're looking at that you're doing it's kind of super interesting i don't want to mess you up here and where you're going it's super interesting but this is a heavy rock for so little under it for me down the road. Psychology. <laughs> Psychology oh. is super, super, super interesting. I love reading about it, but um, I just was astounded um, about how the content created could uh, make me want to not be interested. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just uh, difficult online. <laughs> it's really difficult online uh, to stay engaged in a monotone lecture that goes on for an hour and then you get quizzed on it afterwards. I know, that's not mm -hmm. a great way to teach or learn in any context, right? But think about it, if you're at university, you could be in a lecture hall of 200 where a guy sits at the front and gives you a monotone lecture and then they give you a quiz. So I'm not sure what the difference is. At least you can go to the fridge. Or you can do <laughs> <just> come over. <laughs> it's my first year. I, I, I don't know. know what I was expecting. I know, uh, but I know. Maybe the, maybe I'm just uh, explaining the things that all people with university degrees already know. Um, likely, <laughs> that's okay, and that's that's quite legit. The COVID has reminded us that this virtual world has great advantages, but it also has disadvantages. I I can imagine you being in a lecture hall, in a psychology class, having a great conversation, meeting new friends, talking about things sharing notes, learning things. It's really hard in a virtual. Are you meeting anyone in this virtual world, like classmates or anything like that? Or no, it's just pretty much on and off. Um, I've made a total of three friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. That's a lot. I think that's yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Now, are, um, now right yeah, I, I love to make friends. Uh, so I guess it, it, it doesn't seem that way. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. Well, awesome. I think it's nice, like three friends. Um, it's a nice number, I think, for yeah. people that are like next to you all the time. Because if you have a really a large group of friends, you don't necessarily know who you can trust for like uh, certain things and all that. So I think three is a great number. Yeah, three in Chinese culture means everything. Mm. Yeah. And of course, in Catholic, it's the Trinity. Holy cow. So <laughs> three days. The number three is everything. So, okay. Because I can't keep this I, I will not. Crap, okay? I, I will not be telling my brand new friends that they're the Holy Trinity for me. <laughs> that is one way to get rid of my new friends. <laughs> oh, I think it just might grab them and. You know, grapple them to your soul with a hoop of steel. That's what I think. <laughs> anyway, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But there's a, uh, you know, there's much to be said about who you are, Cassette. I, like, I, a, a quick 
story. Cassette was involved in many. Remember going to the, we went as a group to the premier's luncheon. Do you remember those? And the, the mayor's luncheon, and they were very good. And do you remember, I have to say about, she is a person who so loves to engage people. This must be, I, like when you said you have three friends, I'm stunned. That's a lot <laughs> for being unable to engage them. And I, I think that's just you. That's a tribute to you and, and some of your, honestly, some of your great gifts about engaging people. And I'll never forget, and just so you know, you'll be forever immortalized in the magnificent annals because when we were um, at one of those premier's luncheons, the great cup was on display. Mm -hmm. And so I took a picture, I went, oh, I gotta get a picture with the great cup. And I was, I was <laughs> sitting beside Cosette. Of course, she's in the picture. So anytime I show this picture, or, hey, I got a picture with the great cup, Cosette's in the picture. <laughs> so they're all saying, hey, yes. Oh, it's Kate Devine. Awesome kid. She's gonna be she's gonna be running the whole CFL one year. So I thought this would be a great picture. <laughs> That's what I can see. So you're forever in the magnificent. You'll be in the magnificent folklore forever. Now that you're in the great cup. <laughs> My only great cup picture is with the great cup. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of we only bombed. had it for a couple seconds. I know it was quick, and we just jumped in there. You photo bombed me, Adriano. I know. You know what? And I, you know, obviously, if you, I think you have the picture too. You'll Photoshop me out, and uh, I'll just want you to. I'll keep you in the picture. So, <laughs> what an awesome kid. All right. Hey, anyway, we're coming to the end of our show today. Cassette. Is there any? Do you have any last parting pieces of advice for a high school kid who's in grade eleven or twelve trying to figure things out? Uh, I definitely, um, I think not knowing what you want to do, um, is totally fine. And I think anyone listening to this podcast is probably listening to it because they either do know what they want to do and they're trying to get there or they have no idea and they're trying to get some inspiration. Um, and I think taking it as it comes is awesome. Uh, say yes to everything because as a teenager, you have only everything to gain. Yes, say yes mm -hmm. to everything. What, I'll add say yes with a modicum of discretion, okay? <laughs> just a little bit. Okay? Oh, don't overload yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. if, you take, if you take on too much, then uh, we, we've had some students on in the podcast saying, I'm trying to manage how to do this, and, and, and they're figuring out. But say yes to things that will promote and move you in directions, sometimes that you don't expect, that will, that will but, but connect you, you've got a good kind of, an intuition about I should get involved with this. I, I think we act, take advantage of your intuitions to try things that don't, that you may not necessarily think are exactly what you want to do, but may turn into something. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You know, uh, I think one of the greatest things about LRSD was that kind of everything that I wanted to uh, realize when I was there, they really enabled. Um, so if there's something you like want to do or program, I uh, absolutely ask uh, for if they can like partly fund it. Um, yes, that's one of the. And that's the advantage stoppers. in high school. That's the great. You nailed it, Cosette. In high school, that's your great advantage in this division. Uh, if you want to try something, the teachers and the admins will go out of their way to help you connect to some new possibilities for yourself. I think that's that's been very clear in my life, in my existence working in this division. It's a very proactive and progressive place to work. You know, Cassette, you've been an incredible guest. As always, you're an incredible person. It was always my great privilege to know you for those two years and to continue to know you. I hope you keep in touch with me and with uh, our team. <laughs> that is our holiday episode number 11 of Adventures in Career Lab. So you have been the gift Cassette that we're giving to everybody. This is our <laughs> holiday gift. So I appreciate you uh, being a part of this. Any, any Thank you thoughts? so much for having me on. Oh, you're an awesome guest. I mm -hmm. super appreciate you guys having me on. Um, I have an exam tomorrow. This was such a booster. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, are you kidding? You and, know you well. uh, so once you finish yeah, this, thanks. get back to work and get back to work for that exam and make us all proud. More importantly, make yourself proud because I know you will. Hey, that's the end of our podcast. Lily. Yeah. You know, I'm, uh, I'm excited for these dumplings that are about to come. <laughs> and, um, and, and the barbecue that I know is uh, coming my way as well. For me, it's just a big 
big giant turkey. Italians eat lamb. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, my God. Well, <laughs> that's not a good thing to say on the air. Anyway, beautiful stuff. Anyway, thanks, Cassette. Thanks, Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, as always. That's the end of our podcast, everyone. And there it is. It's our beautiful music. And when the music comes, we know we need to say goodbye. Have a great holiday. Take care of yourself in COVID yeah. land. Be safe. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.